So my topic is about if pregabalin is unsuitable for some or many people for whom it has been prescribed as an alternative to opioids, what happens next? So it leads in well from where the other speakers have started. So I am going to briefly revisit some of the topics that Sean and Rose have already touched on, but I promise I won't cover the same ground too much and labour it, so give me a moment. So what do we know about Lyrica or pregabalin? And I thought it was worth revisiting the safety information that Pfizer itself has given us about this drug. So when you go to www.lyrica.com and look at all the happy people on that website, there's a banner down the right hand side that says important safety information. So Lyrica and Lyrica CR are not for everyone, apparently. Lyrica and Lyrica CR may cause suicidal thoughts or actions in a very small number of people, about one in 500, they say. So just remember that number, one in 500. Patients, family members or caregivers should call the doctor right away if they notice suicidal thoughts or actions, thoughts of self-harm or any unusual changes in mood or behaviour. These changes may include new or worsening depression, anxiety, restlessness, trouble sleeping, panic attacks, anger, irritability, agitation, aggression, dangerous impulses or violence, or extreme increases in activity or talking. If you have suicidal thoughts or actions, do not stop Lyrica or Lyrica CR without talking to you, first talking to your doctor. Good advice. Um, but bearing in mind what Rose and Sean have said, how do the family know any of this? According to this, the family is supposed to be monitoring this person carefully to see if there's any of these changes in their behaviour. I don't know about you, but as a grown-up person, my mum doesn't come to the doctor with me a lot anymore. So I just think that... The wording of that around the caution that family and friends need to have and the monitoring of people is something that hasn't been given a lot of thought either. So, I will talk about the number of scripts dispensed. So, this slide here is just to show you where I got this information from and thanks to the lovely people at the Capital Health Network in Canberra who actually compiled this for me, bless them. But, the graph I'm about, the table I'm about to show you is about prescribing numbers for pregabalin and you can just see on this one that it relates to the different item numbers about the different strengths of the tablets. So that's what we're looking at in this next slide here. And I've done something really annoying here which is put up a table but it's really hard to read. So here I did print out some hard copies of that. You guys can pass around. But for those who have visual challenges similar to mine, let me read off this for you. So what this tells us is what the increase in prescribing has been from 2012-13 through to 2017-18. So if you look at down the bottom the highlighted figures, so this talks about the difference in prescribing across those years. So the smallest increase in prescribing across that time period was in Tasmania, where prescribing only increased by 1,665%. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> The highest it's, um, increase was in the Northern Territory, where prescribing went up 4,207% in that time period. Yes, 1,000, not 100, I'm not saying it wrong. Um, and in the total, when you average that out across the jurisdictions, the increase in prescribing during that time period was 2,510%. Seriously. So if we have a think about that one in 500 figure that we had from the lovely Pfizer people on the first page, um, if you look at 2017-18, and right at the right-hand side column, it's the second box from the bottom on the far right-hand side, we can see that the total MBS, um, PBS services for Lyrica in the year 2017-18 was 3,745,304. Now, 500 goes into that 7,490 times. But we know that some of these prescriptions are going to the same people. It's not all different people. Even if we have it, we're looking at 3,745 people. So whichever way you look at it, we have thousands of people out there who are either experiencing the desire to harm themselves or actually attempting suicide. So that's not a small figure. Um, one in 500 might not sound like much, but when we have the prescribing rates that we now have, that's a lot of people who want to kill themselves or who are actively going about it at any given time. So that's a lot of collateral damage, just saying. Now, I'm going to revisit Rose's work here. Um, so this is the study that Rose in the front row as opposed to the other Rose did um, about the gathering misuse related ambulance attendances in Victoria that she's already told you about. But I just want to reinforce 
some of the gist of what she was saying. So it's actually quite incredible. The rate of pregabalin related ambulance attendances has increased tenfold since 2012, associated with an increase in the national prescription rate. Indeed, patients frequently misuse pregabalin with other sedatives, particularly benzos, and almost 40% of misuse related events requiring para paramedic assistance were suicide attempts. 40%. Of the 1,201 attendances, 49.3% were people who had a history of depression, self-harm, suicidal ideation, suicide attempt or misuse of alcohol or other drugs that may have contraindicated prescribing pregabalin. Of the five pre-existing conditions that contributed to such histories, the most frequent were a history of depression in 40% of people or previous suicide attempt in 16. So it's a little bit foreseeable that these are people with a past history of depression and in some instances suicide. So really demonstrable mental health histories here. So is anyone else worried? It's not just the two roses. <laughs> so at the National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre Symposium in October last year, Dr Amy Peacock's presentation of emerging trends in drug use, harms and markets findings from the Drug Trends um, Project in 2018, highlighted increased non-prescribed use of other drugs, e.g. pregabalin, as being of concern in terms of drug use trends across the nation. And of the sample of people who inject drugs for the illicit drug reporting system um, that was presented in um, 2018, 16.4% had been prescribed pregabalin and a further 26.6% reported non-prescribed use. So it goes to what Rose is saying about rates of use in vulnerable populations. So, and I think that's interesting about the, the difference between prescribed and non-prescribed. There, <laughs> there were two categories there. Meanwhile, I'm about to channel Sean now and talk about that Cochrane review. Sean went through in a few slides the actual detail of that. But I think, for me, the take-home message is here. It's, Moderate quality evidence shows that oral pregabalin at doses of 300 milligrams or 600 milligrams daily has an important effect on pain in some people with moderate or severe neuropathic pain after shingles or due to diabetes. Low quality evidence suggests that oral pregabalin is effective after trauma due to stroke or spinal cord injury. Pregabalin appears to not be effective in neuropathic pain associated with HIV. Very limited evidence is available for neuropathic back pain, neuropathic cancer pain, and some other forms of neuropathic pain. So I guess what I'm getting from that, being an non-clinician, is this is not a miracle drug. It's not fixing everything. And so in that context, the prescribing rates are actually pretty remarkable. So who else is worried? And I'm sure that some of you saw some of the media articles at the end of last year and the beginning of this year, I think it was December, January, published by Fairfax Media specifically the Age and the Sydney Morning Herald. And I've just cut and pasted a chunk out of that article there from the Age in December last year. The article itself is called, This Popular Drug is Linked to Addiction and Suicide. Why do doctors keep prescribing it? So what they came up with in their newspaper article was that in Victoria, there are 164 overdose deaths linked to the drug between 2013 and 2017. There have been almost 88 pregabalin associated deaths in New South Wales since 2005, increasing at almost 60% a year. Health authorities have re records of six suicides of patients taking the drug. That's the ones we already have confirmed. 86,000 Australians who have been prescribed the drug appear to be abusing it, according to one study, yet many doctors consider it a safe medicine to replace opiates. Now, that's an important point, because I noticed that the RACGP came out with an article within the last week as well that talked about that overarching reluctance to prescribe opioids and the, the effect that that's having in the context of access to palliative care as well. So I think that there is a context that needs to be understood in terms of the way some doctors are now fearing what will happen if they prescribe too many opioids in the wake of some of the events overseas and have kind of, it would seem, seized on this drug as a safer alternative and got a little bit carried away. Um, so pregabalin's officially listed side effects, as reported in the article, included depression, blurred vision, confusion and suicidal thoughts, yet it is often given to people who have depression or a history of self-harm. Yes, this was reported in the mainstream media, but as we've heard from Rose, that is not fake news, that is actually true. 
Pregabalin's use exploded after it was approved as a treatment for nerve pain, but later studies now have some experts fearing it may not work at all for as many as half the conditions it is being prescribed for, which goes to what the Cochrane Review came up with. So it's not just us weird researchers and people in the AAD sector who are thinking this is a thing. Um, it's actually being described in the mainstream media too now. So that's a bit of a recap. Um, but why am I worried about this? Why is Abel worried about this? Obviously, we're the Australian injecting an illicit drug users league and this is not an illicit drug. Why am I banging on about it? Um, the reason I'm banging on about it is it follows on from what Rose was saying in terms of subpopulations that might be disproportionately affected by some of the harms. And that's where I'm going to. So what brought me initially to this topic um, was some personal experiences last year. I had a really hard year last year, um, particularly with one former work colleague and very close friend of mine who had at the time what we thought were a series of polydrug overdoses, um, messy polydrug overdoses that me and the other 20 services he was in contact with thought were accidents. Um, they weren't. They actually turned out to be a series of escalating suicide attempts. Um, I'm a person who's worked in the drug and alcohol for 20, sector for 20 years. I've worked in policy, I've worked in government as a funding body, I've worked in drug and alcohol treatment services. I was looking straight at this and didn't see it. You know, there was someone in front of me who was overdosing repeatedly and I thought it was careless and accidental. It wasn't. It was actually escalating suicide attempts. And for me to be looking at right at that and not see it, is a little bit incredible and goes to how we figure out what are accidental polydrug overdoses and what are deliberate suicides. And the thing that really struck me, at the time, you know, dealt with the situation, spent two nights in accident emergency waiting to see if he would live, ringing his mum at 15 minute intervals, the whole lot. Um, understood after the second very serious one where we spent the whole night next to the crash cart waiting to see how that would pan out. That one, it was when it became apparent to me that they were suicide attempts. He had actually had a polydrug overdose earlier in the day um, on pregabalin and opioids. An ambulance had been called, he administered, a naloxone had been administered and he had come to. However, he'd then gone home um, and got another prescribed box of Lyrica and eaten the whole box of them. And it was then when it became pretty clear to me that things weren't accidental anymore. However, even in the A&E situation in the hospital when we were talking about whether he was going to live or die. And I was saying to the doctors and nurses, so if he does make it through the night, when's the psych team coming to do the psych evaluation? Like, what psych team? No, why would we be calling the psych team? I said, because this is a suicide attempt. And if he wakes up, I really want someone to come and do a mental health assessment. And I really think this needs to be done. You reckon it's a suicide attempt? Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure, given that he's told me that he wants to kill himself and he's eaten like a whole box of these things, I'm fairly sure it's a suicide attempt. But the penny didn't drop for me that pregabalin was a factor. I was still back with the, this is a polydrug overdose, you know, is he really depressed, what's going on, blah. Context was, um, this was someone who worked in the alcohol and other drug sector, had done for a long time, had a car accident at work, um, was on a methadone maintenance program previously, got a shoulder injury in the car accident work, at work and got prescribed pregabalin for non-specific nerve pain relating to the shoulder injury. And I didn't understand, I understood the correlation, obviously I understood he used the Lyrica to try and overdose, what I didn't understand that the Lyrica might have a contributing factor to why he had overdosed. And when the penny dropped for me was in December when I was reading these media articles and I read that, you know, some of the stories the anecdotes from the individuals in the media articles and I went, shit, this is what I was looking at last year and I didn't even realise it. I wanted to throw up, like I seriously wanted to throw up. I just thought, how can someone like me, who has this 20 year history in the sector, not have seen this thing when it was right in front of me? So I guess where I'm coming from is less about the potential for misuse in terms of recreational drug use and more about the link with suicide and how do we tease out what are accidental overdoses and what are deliberate suicide attempts and what is the messaging we need to do to particular subgroups around that sort of stuff. So after I read the newspaper article and um, 
splashed some cold water on my face and um, recovered my thoughts, I got on the phone and started ringing everyone I knew to ask what they thought about this and whether they thought there might be something in this. So, I have spoken to a multitude of people. Um, I've spoken obviously to Rose, I've spoken to Amy Peacock at the National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre, I've spoken to Nadina Ezard at NCRED, who's the CEO of NCRED and also a doctor working in emergency situations at the moment. And everyone was like, yeah, Mel, this is a thing. We've been thinking this might be a thing. Do you think it's a thing? Yeah, we should talk about this. Then I spoke to some more service providers. So Nadine, again, who's working in the space in a similar way to Sean. Um, I spoke to our member organisations, obviously at ABLE, we run a range of primary care services across the jurisdictions looking at what they were seeing. And I spoke to nurses in primary care and in other spaces. And everywhere I went, people were like, yeah, I've seen this, this is a thing. Um, Darren Smith, who's the president of the Drug and Alcohol Nurses of Australasia, was telling me that they stopped prescribing Lyrica in New South Wales prisons a couple of years ago because it became such a drug of choice that standovers and bullying over people's scripts became an issue. And also it increased the risk of overdose on exit from custody when people would leave and go to a <coughs> private doctor and get their scripts up and you know it would en enhance the risk of overdose in that time period after leaving jail. So everyone I spoke to everywhere I went went, yeah, I've got another little piece of the puzzle. I can see something here. And clinched it for me when I was at a nurse practitioner's workshop about hep C treatment. And I, people were, you know, what are you doing? We're at the dinner. What are you doing at work at the moment? I said, oh, I'm looking into this issue. And the nurse who was sitting next to me said, I've had an experience with that. My daughter had, um, oh goodness, what was it? It was something that Lyrica wasn't indicated for anyway, but a pain condition. Um, was put on Lyrica, rang me two days later and said, Mum, I'm starting to have thoughts about killing myself. They put me on a new medication half a week ago. Should I keep taking it? No, darling, stop taking the tablets. I'm getting on a plane now. I'll come and see the doctor with you tomorrow and make an appointment. Everywhere I go, someone has had an experience with this. So I decided what we needed to do was all get together and talk. And that's why I'm so glad that Pennington's doing this as well. We need to actually close the loop and get people together to talk about what we do next. So. With that in mind, Abel had a meeting in Canberra, um, I think it was about the 20th of last month, where we brought together some different stakeholders to think about the implications moving forward. So what we discussed on the agenda were these things that I've listed here, but some of the players that were there, we had the Australian Medical Association, the Australian <coughs> Professional Society for Alcohol and Drugs, State and Territory and the Federal Health Department were included, service providers, including AOD agencies and peer orgs, we had a representative from the primary health networks. We had the National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre and the National Centre for Clinical Research on Emerging Drugs. We got a whole heap of people in a room um, and talked about what our various perspectives were and what the implications of that might be. So I promised Stephen, because he wasn't able to be here, that I would do a little bit of a spiel about what we talked about that day. So this was basically an outline of the, the agenda of what we thought needed discussing and I just want to kind of run you through some of the things we got to in that discussion because I think it's helpful today. So where I started in thinking about this from an ABLE perspective is what are the key messages for service users? So should my member organisations be out highlighting the link with depression, suicide and overdose and advising people to talk to their doctor if they have concerns? That was kind of where I started in terms of what ABLE could do but then the obvious question arising from that is if people go to their doctor, what's the doctor going to say? Is there going to be something useful that's going to happen there? So that was when I started talking to doctors groups about what the information and communication was with doctors. So where we got to on that first dot point is probably what my organisations and those in the AOD space need to be doing initially is reinforcing our existing messaging around poly drug use, around naloxone, <coughs> where there are peer-based naloxone programs in place, reinforcing those messages around yes, you do still have to call the ambulance because it might just not be what you think, um, but not getting too carried away with Pregabalin-specific messaging until we have a better understanding of the subgroups and their needs and the messaging. So we then talked about key messages for clinicians. So what should prescribers be saying or to or doing for people for whom Pregabalin use may be problematic or have become a concern? And what are the implications for withdrawal and pain management? 
In terms of the messaging to doctors, participants talked about the difference between new and what they called legacy patients. So there needed to be a regime of information for doctors highlighting the things that rose and Sean and I have talked about, you know, here is the contraindications, please, you know, ask people about their mental health history, etc, etc. But the group talked about that, that will be appropriate for pe doctors who are considering initiating people onto pregabalin, but what about everyone who's already on it? You know, and what do we do about that? And a number of the clinicians were saying, look, for people who are going okay, it's fine. Like, it has been a good option in terms of pain management. Those people are probably fine to continue. But for people who are finding it a problem and do want an alternative, there's a question around withdrawal management because there's just not an established withdrawal protocol around this. A number of doctors are starting to do slow reduction regimes, similar to what's currently done for benzos, but there's actually not a lot of established protocols or awareness within hospital-based withdrawal units about the needs of this subpopulation. So that's an issue as well. And Pain Australia was at the meeting as well, and they were talking about you know, the systemic problems in terms of pain management and people getting access to alternative medications and services and how that was gonna be a significant barrier for people as well. So some of the consequential actions for consideration that we highlighted were who best to deliver these key messages to service users and clinicians? It's probably, I mean, we talk about in our sector peer-based education all the time, and we can do that bit, but we recognise as well that for doctors, they probably don't want to get their information on what they should be telling their patients from ABLE. We probably need someone like the AMA or the RACGP to get on board and help us with that messaging for doctors. So we've gone away to have a think about that, and the Federal Department has gone away to have a talk to the National Prescribing Service about some of the supporting materials that they provide to doctors in that context. Are there systemic capacity issues in terms of withdrawal services and the broader AOD treatment <coughs> system that will present barriers for service users and clinicians? Short answer, yes. Um, we already know we need to double the number of drug treatment places in Australia for existing capacity. So obviously any new population of people that are going to require assistance, there will need to be the capacity within the system to do that. And in terms of alternative pain management strategies, we know that there's a lack of physical rehabilitation services and alternative medications, so that's going to be an issue that we're going to have to address as well. And what are the resourcing implications for different stakeholder groups? We need to give that some thought to, and it's about capacity in the AOD sector, capacity in the pain management sector, and about a coordinated response around what we do to respond to this issue going forward. Last question was, do we need further targeted research to inform the development of responses by different stakeholder groups? Yes, is the short answer to that. And I think Rose has covered that really well in her final slide. But for mine, the really serious issue, and in talking to um, Amy Peacock as well, in all the data sets we've got, it's really hard to tell the difference between an accidental polydrug overdose and a deliberate suicide where pregabalin's a factor. And that's something that we really need to think about in terms of our research design in the next little while, because that will really have implications for the messaging that we do with different population groups around their respective risk. So that's where we need to go to. So I guess in conclusion, there's nothing that these guys have said before me that I don't agree with wholeheartedly. And I think for our entire sector and related sectors, there's a challenge here. But from the perspective of ABLE, a really important message here is that we don't have a knee-jerk response. We now have a growing tide of awareness, but if we do have an issue now with substantive addiction to pregabalin and a link with depression and suicidal ideation, you can't go just throwing people off their scripts. And that's what we're concerned about, is that doctors are gonna go, oh no, I've made a mistake, I need to not do this, and start throwing people off scripts. Well, if they weren't depressed and suicidal, before they got thrown off their scripts, then they bloody well will be very soon after they get thrown off their scripts. So we need to have some thought, some thoughtful discussions about, yes, yeah, something bad's happened, what are the logical responses, and what are the flow-on effects of that that need to be considered? And how can we get messages to service users, to services and clinicians that actually are meaningful and mean that when people do go and ask for help, they get a response that is consistent from the different people that they're going to be speaking to about it. So I think we've got a lot of challenges moving forward, but the very fact that we're having this discussion and getting together and that there's so much commonality and goodwill in what we're talking about, I think stands us in good stead going forward. So thank you everyone for having me today.